Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. Hi, how are you? Good to see you today. Welcome online if you're joining us. I know we probably have a disproportionate amount of people joining us online with all the rain, but hey, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad if you came and you braved the rain, thank you for coming. It's awesome. We are in a series that we are ending today called Encouraging Words because we all need encouragement. We've been looking at different ways of challenge that we go through life. And today we're going to be talking about just just disappointing things, when things don't go well for us and we get disappointed. There's a lot of things to cause us to be disappointed, right? I mean, events, I mean, we can, you know, you get a gift and you, you're hoping somebody's going to really like it and they go, what? You know, or you get something on eBay and you think, that's not what I thought I was getting. Uh, sometimes a trip, we book, we save up money and we go on a trip and then it's not what we had hoped for. That happened to Sharon and I not too long ago. Uh, just a few years ago, we decided to go on down to Fort Lauderdale to pick up one of those little four-day cruises to the Bahamas. And it had snowed. It was in the winter, so it snowed the day, the day before and the day we were leaving. So we barely got a got a plane out of here in Charlotte. We had a hard time. They had to reroute us. We find, we just barely made the cruise. I mean, we were the last ones on the boat, but our luggage didn't make it. And, and th so that's not, you can just see where it's going. It's not a real good cruise. I mean, you show up, it was snowing where we were, so I'm in like a turtleneck, and you know, and, and that's all I have. I mean, we don't have our toiletries, our medication, anything, not one piece of clothing, which is probably not the best way to travel anyways, but we, that's, that was our situation. And so we're wandering around the, the boat, and we're just, you know, and we sleep in that clothes, and then the next day is like, it's like formal night. It's where you go see the captain. We're, thought, we're not seeing the captain in this. So I went and told the guy, I said, hey, we can't even go. We don't, we're not dressed for that. They said, well, we have like behind, you wouldn't know this unless this has happened to you. They go, oh, well, we have this happening from time to time. And so we have a special room of clothing for formal night. I thought, really? And they said, oh, yeah. I said, where did that clothes come from? Oh, it's just people like discarded over the years and we just save it all. I thought, well, let me look at it. It's like clothes from the 1950s. <laughs> I mean, I go in there and there's like, you know, crazy, you know, colors and nothing matches and, and it, it just, there's dust on it. So I, I, I found like a jacket that might work for me. I grabbed a couple full length gowns and Sharon, 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 I brought them to Sharon. What do you think? She goes, no way I'm not wearing those, you know. <laughs> we ended up eating in the kids section, I think, you know. <laughs> Disappointing. It's not what we wanted. But as disappointing as events can be or things you get online or whatever, you know, the most disappointing things of all can be people. When people disappoint us, when people let us down, when they give us their promise and then they don't fulfill it, when they tell us one thing and they, they do something else, I mean, those, that can be pretty painful. It really hurts. And so dealing with disappointment is what we're going to talk about. You know who's a pro at dealing with disappointment is is Moses. Moses had all kinds of disappointing things. I want to look at a passage of Scripture today out of Exodus 15. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Exodus 15. If you have an app on your phone, open that up, Exodus 15. We're going to look at that together. Now, of course, it's on your outline, but I'd like you to follow along this, this, this passage. Just, it, and it, Moses has this disappointing situation. I mean, and the, kind of where the Israelites, Israelites are at this place is, is their default is to criticize Moses. Anything that goes wrong, it's Moses' fault. You know, they're always blaming Moses. And so Moses is kind of like, he gets discouraged. He gets disappointed. And he's a pro at working through it. So we're going to look at what Moses does. Certainly we can learn from that. 
Now, the context of this story there in Exodus 15 is they had just come out of, they've been delivered from Egypt with those great, those 10 plagues that God sends against Pharaoh because he won't let his people go. Then he goes through the Red Sea and, and now they're, they're, they're on the other side of that and they have a water problem. Uh, it seems like they've had a, a couple water problems. I mean, just earlier, three days earlier, they have too much water, the Red Sea. God opens that up. Then for, the next, for those three days afterwards, they're in the desert. They don't have any water. They don't have enough water. And now they're at a place of bitter water, of bitter water. And this is where we pick up the story. Here they are, uh, Exodus 15, and it's beginning in verse 22. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled into the desert without finding water. So the only water they have is whatever they brought with them. They're running out. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. Marah means bitterness. And so here is the first principle we pull from this story is that even when life gives us great successes like they did with the Red Sea, right after that we find ourselves in a failure, in a place of hardship, in a place of bitterness. This is what was going on right here. Here they are. Great successes are often followed by failure. Uh, three days later, I mean, they had, that's a big success. The Red Sea, I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, the, you know, the Psalms and the, the prophets, they're all pointing back to that, you know, hey, if, if you know, Look at what God did at the Red Sea. This is only three days later. And, and, and God had done this magnificent success. And now, they're, and now they're being tripped up here in this place of bitterness. They're kind of being tested. It's a hard place for them. You know, when the Israelites were going into the promised land, into the Cana, the biggest city of all, Jericho, they conquered that no problem. There were the enemies there, and they, all they did was just did what God told them to do. They circled the city, and then the walls fell down when they blew their trumpets. I mean, this, this incredible miracle. But then just a couple days later, the very next city was a little village called Ai, and they get their butt whooped there. I mean, they just get, they get, they get hammered. They lose. They get defeated on a little teeny. So you see, here's the thing. When you have a big success, you're ripe for a failure. You've got to be careful. If you just had a big success in your life, you've got to be careful because the next thing that could come is, a, is, is something that's not so good. It's like a mountaintop. What happens when you reach the mountaintop? Every, every, every way out is down, right? You, you, and, and so you, that happens. That's part of the way the ebbs and flows of life often work. This is certainly what's going on here. God leads them. Notice, he led them to Mara. Said there the Lord made a decree and a law for them. There the Lord tested them. So he tested them here in Mara. Doesn't say that about the Red Sea. See, they didn't have faith to go through the Red Sea. Moses had faith. God blessed that. It was a test of God's character at the Red Sea, but it's a test of their character at Mara in the, the smaller place. You know, it's the, sometimes it's the littler things. The big crisis of life, oh God, I need your help. But in the small things, oh, I got it, God, I, I don't need your help. But often those are the places where we get tested the most. The small disappointments of life, the daily irritations, not so much always the big, the big ones. Israel's response. Now this is the thing. When you're in a place of disappointment, what do you do? What are your sons? Israel did not do a very good job. Verse 24 says, So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? That's their response. And that's the typical response of most people to gripe, to grumble, to blame leadership, criticize their leader. And here's the next, this really leads us to the next point, which is great service is often followed by forgetfulness. People forget the, the great things that have happened before. When people have been served, when people have been helped, it's easy to forget it. People often have a short memory. Israel certainly did. When everything, whenever they were in a problem, they forget all the great things that God did, and they fall into grumbling and murmuring and criticizing. It's one of the reasons why they were in the desert for 40 years before they could get into the promised land. It didn't take that long to get there. only took, took a couple weeks. They're there 40 years because 
That's a place becomes a place of testing for them. God's working on their character. It's working on them. You know, people tend to forget even great things that we've done. You may be in a job right now where you have really done some terrific things for your business or your company or your place of employment, and they don't remember it. You know, they're just saying, well, you're only as good as your last meal. You know, don't you remember, though, you say, uh, I really helped, you know, I saved the company thousands of dollars. I rescued them out of the bankruptcy. I did this. Well, yeah, well, we don't care. We, oh, what, what do you got for us today? We tend to forget. And we don't appreciate what people have done in the past. Kids do that for parents. They don't appreciate them a lot of times. Oh, the great service that they've done. They forget. They forget. Right? It happens with spouses. We don't, we don't appreciate our husband or, 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 or our wife and all that they've done for us, even though we crave appreciation. It's like the guy, oh, he's an old guy, and he goes to the doctor for, for a checkup. Doctor gives him some advice. This guy's like in his 80s, you know, 80, 82, 83. He a few a few weeks later, the doctor sees the, the, the guy out on the street and he's got this good-looking young girl on his arm. He's thinking, wow, 80-year-old guy. And so anyways, next office visit, which wasn't, wasn't very long uh, after that, he goes, I guess you're doing okay. I saw you had that young girl under your arm. He goes, Doc, I'm just doing what you told me. <laughs> you know, you said, go get a hot mama and be cheerful. And the doctor said, no, I said, you have a heart murmur and be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when we crave appreciation, if people have been, you know, you, go, you look for wherever you can get it. Certainly, we need to be appreciative. Can't forget what people have done. If you're a dream team leader, you appreciate the service that your dream team does. And you look for opportunities to show that. We need to be encouraging Especially we live in a society where there's a lot of things to be disappointed in, right? What happens when you're disappointed? Well, we see in this story a couple of things that we should not do, a couple of things that we should do. Let's look at those. First of all, don't, you don't rehearse it. In other words, just in your mind, you know, when something happens, somebody hurts your feelings, somebody disappoints you, and we just kind of go over it and over it and over it. We really often make a mountain out of a molehill. We often make it way bigger than it really should be. And then often we rehearse it, not just with ourselves, but with other people. We tell that person, and we tell that person, and we gossip about our boss over here, and we try to get some kind of, uh, some kind of an alignment of, of people that all agree with me over here. And we're rehearsing it. We never, we never, we never really resolve it. Job 5.2 says, To worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish thing to do. That sounds like wisdom, right? Don't worry, don't, don't get all caught up in rehearsing that stuff. Get rid of all business, anger, all bitterness, anger, and slander along with every form of malice. Be careful that you don't blow it out of proportion. And don't let yourself fall into negativity. Negativity is, is an addictive cycle, you know. You're just always negative. Oh, there's so much, there's a lot to be negative about. And that's often how we justify it. You know, the reason I'm always so negative is there's so many bad things in, happening in the world. And so many bad things happening to me. And we just get negative, negative, negative. I was never aware of how negative I was or other people was until uh, a particular event that happened to me. When I was 18 years old, I graduated high school. Uh, I guess I was 19 because it was after my first year of college. I, I signed up to be a door-to-door -door book salesman with this company called Eagle West. And uh, I grew up in Arizona. We, they put you in a different state, you know, so that you're not tempted to, to, to quit because it's hard. And so we went to Oklahoma. And, and so for a whole week, you have sales school. So right after college, you go to the sales school and you're just immersed in how to sell, how to do cold calling, and a lot of positive. They're, they're always talking about, hey, you got to remain positive. There's a lot of negativity out there. And so a whole week, I'm just, okay, I'm positive, I'm positive. I'm going to, you know, I'm all, all fired up. We drive to uh, Oklahoma. We show up at the first restaurant when we get there and I, I it's like everybody's negative. I'm thinking, dang, I didn't realize everybody's so negative. And really, it's just life. You know, I just wasn't aware of it. And then o over, the, over the weeks and months and then really years, I've just always tried to be, I have to almost sometimes coach myself. I can fall into it like anybody else. And I go, I don't want to be negative. 
I want to be positive. I want to take that road less traveled. I don't want to, because it, it can be, we're just, our whole life is consumed with negative self-talk, negative talking to others. And so you, you don't want to rehearse it. Don't nurse it. Don't take it personally. Don't fall into having a pity party for yourself. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So he says anger can turn into something. He says, so you're, you were angry, somebody upset you, or you had, you know, somebody disappointed you. And then you just let that thing fester. And he says, you know, just even letting enough time so that the sun goes down could be a problem for you. And what happens is the devil gets a foothold, starts to, starts to work on that thing. You start nursing it. You start going over that, and it turns into bitterness, turns into resentment. That's what happens to that. It just doesn't stay neutral. It doesn't just stay there. You either start to work through that, or you nurse it and let it get worse. Job 18.4 says, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. You're only hurting yourself with your anger. And it's human nature to get angry when people disappoint us, right? It's just human nature. We're all, we're, we're all, we all get that. But you have to recognize if you let that get the best of you, you are hurting yourself. I'm so glad that the Apostle Paul, when he got disappointed, he didn't give up. I mean, there's people that disappointed him. There's a lot of people you read in Galatians that Peter disappointed him and, and that Barnabas disappointed him and then other places we see that Timothy disappointed him and John Mark disappointed him. I mean he could have just said you know what I'm going alone this is too hard to work with people I'll just do it myself or he could have just said I quit I'm going to go home and you know just eat some food and watch some football close the blinds you know I'm just I'm checking out I'm glad that Jesus didn't let all the disappointments that came his way get the best of him. What if he had decided, you know what, it's, I, I'm so disappointed, everybody. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going back to heaven before he even went to the cross. You know, he like shocks the angels. Whoa, Jesus, you're up here too early. Hey, listen, they don't appreciate me down there. <laughs> you know, they're disappointing me. You, you, I was just expecting things to be different down there. No, Jesus perseveres. I'm so thankful for that. You see, the thing is, is when people disappoint you, you are at a crossroads. You can get into a situation where you just get over and over in your mind, where you let, you let all that anger just get the best of you. You start to nurse it. Now, here's what Moses did. I like this is a great example. Here's people are grumbling against him. They're criticizing his leadership. He's disappointed, but here's what he does. Then Moses cried out. This is verse 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water and the water became sweet. And so I want to focus in at this point just with this. He cried out to the Lord. That's to, dis we do disperse it. You disperse it. This is something you want to do. You give it away to God. You say, God, you care about me. You know my situation. Instead of just going and telling everybody else and gossiping everywhere. And it's really a mark of a leader Somebody who can recognize, I need to give this to God. Certainly is a mark of a Christian leader. What does it mean to become a Christ follower? It, what it means is to recognize that you have a Father in heaven who loves you. He's also the creator of the universe and the master of everything and, and has the authority to, to change circumstances. And so you go to God. That's what it means. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, if you're, if you're a believer, but you don't go to God, you're acting like an unbeliever. That's what it means. And so a practical atheist is a Christian who doesn't go to God with their concerns. It means you're just acting like, a, like an atheist. You, you believe in God, but practically you, you don't act like it. And so we go to God. We go, God, and you, you do what Moses do. You cry out to the Lord, God, this frustrates me. I'm disappointed in this. This is the place that you go. You don't put on a pity party. You don't go over and over in your mind. And you, Psalm 55, 2 says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will sustain you. And then you let God reverse it. See, God does some amazing things because of his ability to change things. He can actually... Uh, morph circumstances 
and, 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 and reverse them. And the Bible calls it redeeming it. In other words, it, 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 it's not just it's, it's not just, well, that's, there's nothing I can do about that. That's history. That's the way it is. No, God actually takes our history and makes it his story. You know, he, 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 he incorporates it into his plan and his purpose for you. Somebody who, um, who I think of who had all the reason in the world to be bitter and resentful, resentful and it's, it's Joseph. Joseph in the Bible. He's the son of Jacob. He had 11 other brothers. Most of his brothers got jealous of him, envious of him. And so they turned against him. When he's only 17 and they, they sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. They thought, hey, even better than killing him, sell him into slavery. Sell him into slavery. He goes into slavery. He's treated terribly. He ends up in prison, falsely accused. In prison, just languishing in prison. That's a place of disappointment. People made him. It's not like he deserved to go there. People turned on him. People that shouldn't have. People that should have been loyal to him. Here he is. He could have gotten bitter with that. Now, it just so happens that because of God's hand involved, he didn't get bitter. He didn't get resentful. So God's hand was kind of steering all of that so that he ends up becoming in a position of power. So much so that he can use his position of power to save his brothers, which he does. Now, if he was caught up in bitterness, you think he would have done that? No, he could have smoked them. He could have said, hey, I'm getting you, man. You, 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 after what you did, you are toast. No, he saved, he actually saves the whole nation of Israel. The whole nation of Israel because of what people had done to hurt him. Intentionally, they hurt him. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get resentful. In fact, when he's talking to his brothers later on, he's, here's what he says. He doesn't minimize what they did to him. Here's what he says. He says, you intend, he's talking to his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. That's an amazing statement from somebody who had so much hardship in his life. He goes, you intended it, which is true. They did intend it to harm him. Because but God intended it for good. Now, how can God intend something for good? Because God, he allows human, human beings to have free will. And then they hurt us sometimes, sometimes unintentionally, many times intentionally. But his hand is always in there. You know, his hand's always kind of directing. It's almost like you were to look at Joseph's life, if you know his story, and you'd say, how else would a, an unknown sheep herder in another country become the ruler of the world in just 13 years. It's almost like there's no other way. But there would have been. There would have been. But God used the harmful intentions of people, how they hurt him. And yet, because he didn't get bitter, because he didn't get filled with resentment, God just kept steering him. You see, nobody can keep God's purpose in your life from happening. Nobody can thwart God's will in your life. God's will is unthwartable. I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> God's will is unthwartable for your destiny in your life, no matter, because it doesn't matter, no matter what people do and say, except for you. You're the only one who can sabotage God's will in your life. It's true. And that's, that's a lot of responsibility. I get that. That's why we're so, that's why, that's why our purpose of our church is helping you discover your purpose. And to make a difference with your life. That's why we offer growth track. You go, hey, growth track sounds like a good idea. Hey, it's everything. It's not the curriculum itself, but what we want to produce out of that is we want, uh, we want every Christ follower, we want every person who doesn't know Christ to come to know Christ, to know God. Well, that's, our, that's, that's our stated vision. We want everybody to know God. And we want people to find freedom, and we want them to find their purpose, and we want them to make a difference. That's our vision. That's what, that's, that's, what, that's what propels us forward as a church. And so it's very important to us. And we know that the only thing that can keep you from fulfilling God's purpose in your life is you. We see this from Joseph, and certainly Moses had a lot coming at his life as well. You know, Paul brings up this great topic of, of disappointment disappointing things, harmful things, hurtful things. And he says how God works them in your life. 
Romans 8, 28, the New King James Version. He says, and we know that in all things God works to, for those who love God, who are called according to our purposes. And we know that in all things God works together for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things, what is that? Even the bad? Yes. Even things that people do to us uh, intentionally to hurt us? Yes. So even disappointments in life? Yes. All things God works to bring about his purpose in your life. When you become a Christ follower, you sign up for a father who loves you. He loves you. And everything is father filtered. Nothing happens to us that God doesn't allow. It doesn't mean that's his, there's, 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 there's hardship in the world, no doubt about that. But God filters that. And when you start to realize that, you realize that, wow, it's not just a disappointment, it's an appointment. An appointment for God to do something in my life. I'm not going to fall into bitterness. I'm not going to fall into resentment because then I will miss God's blessing for me. Verse 25, God provides a solution. Then my, Moses cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. So here, it's really a miracle, right? It's a piece of wood. It's like a tree and, and, and God shows it to him. I don't think Moses would have seen that if he was all caught up in bitterness and resentment. Because he's not. He sees, hey, there's a piece of wood. And this certainly is a symbol of what God does thousands of years later on the cross, on Calvary. There was a tree there where Jesus hung on that tree and he died. And when he died, that piece of wood, when we apply the cross to our lives, it turns our resentment, our, our, our bitterness, our disappointments, our shame, our regrets, our sin, all of it turns it sweet. He transforms it. And this is what this is pointing to, that there's something greater. So we have in great successes, we'll often we'll have a failure. In great services, often we discover forgetfulness. So either ourselves or other people forget. And then third, great shortages are often followed by fullness. By fullness. There is a, there's a turnaround in this story, we say. This is often a turnaround in life. Exodus uh, there, uh, 15, verse 26, Moses said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. He's talking about the plagues. For I am the Lord your, who heals you. So he declares, God says, I love you. I care about you. I want to bring healing. Certainly the healing is physical healing, but of course that would apply to emotional healing, mental healing, spiritual healing. Now notice this. They're going to leave Mara. And here's what happens. It says, then they came to Elam. So they left Mara, the place of bitterness. They come to Elam. What's Elam like? Well, there's 12 springs, 12 springs and 70 palm trees. That's a reason to stay in camp there for a while. They stay there over a month. They're going somewhere, but they think, oh, this is nice. You know, 12 springs. They're bubbling artesian wells. Or, and then the uh, palm trees, there's dates or coconuts or a kai fruit. Just, hey, they're in it, man. They're going, hey, this is nice. So here, they're in a place of bitterness and they stay there, but God had another place for them to go, which is Elam. Now, they were supposed to, God directed them to, to Mara, but their destination was somewhere else. And, they, and you know, if you were to go onto Google Maps and put in Mara and put on Elam, you will find that they're only five miles apart. It was right around the corner. Here they are, they're caught up, they're complaining, they're grumbling, and this great place of fullness is just right around the corner for them. You know, if you're familiar with that, uh, the, the story in the, uh, in the Andes back in uh, 1970, uh, in the early 70s, when that plane crashed in the Andes and they started cannibalizing each other, I think they made a movie about it. And they started eating each other. Actually, they started eating the pilots first. They thought, hey, the pilots got us in this situation. Let's eat them. <laughs> Kind of made sense, right? They were eating them. Anyways, when they get rescued, they were shocked to find out that there was a resort just six miles away from where the plane crashed. All the food they could have had. You know, when you find yourself in a 
disappointing situation. You can just like get sucked up right into there. God wants to bring you somewhere. He wants you to bring, he wants to bring you to Elam. He wants to bring a place of, of, out of a place of dryness and hardship into a place of delight, a place of abundance. So what's the story of Mara? The story of Mara is, is we tend to stop so, too soon. We tend to just to stop. I'm done. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to keep pushing on. C.S. Lewis said, hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an, ordin ordinarily, uh, an extraordinary destiny. So how do you get from Mara to Elam, a place of hardship, of difficulty? You keep going. You keep going. You're in a difficult place in your marriage. You keep going. You're in a difficult place in, in, with your dream. You have a dream and you're finding disappointment. You keep going. You just keep persevering. You go, Andy, I don't feel like it. Sometimes I, I just, I feel like, I don't, I don't feel excited about it anymore, about my marriage. You know, maybe, maybe something that was sweet now is bitter. Well, what are you doing this? You listen, you ignore your feelings. I, I've never met a feeling I can trust. You, you, you know, maturity is, 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 is living by your commitments, not by your feelings. Could you imagine if you, on Monday morning, you called your boss and you said, hey, I know you want me gun-ho about this job. You want me excited and fired up. And to tell you the truth, I'm not feeling that way right now. <laughs> so, you know, you wouldn't want me to be a hypocrite. So I'm just going to stay home, turn on the TV, eat some potato chips, and when I feel excited, I'll, you can expect me in, <laughs> right? That probably wouldn't go through well. Some of your bosses are going, oh, I have employees like that. That's a problem. <laughs> but you ignore your feelings. You go regardless. It's like the guy who got up, he decided he's not going to go to his church. His wife notices. He's in, still in bed. She goes, aren't you going to church today? He goes, I'm not going to church. She goes, why? He goes, well, for three reasons. One, nobody likes me there. Number two, I don't have any friends. And thirdly, I'm just not going. She goes, well, let me give you three reasons you should go. Number one is people do like you. Number two, you do have some friends. And three, you're the pastor, so get out of bed. You got to go. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you just got to do things even if you don't feel like it, right? You just keep going. But when you're in a place of disappointment and your feelings are screaming and you've got pain in your life and you're discouraged. You can just fall into a hole. That's why God's encouraging word for you is, is that don't stay there. You keep going. You align yourself with other people that can speak words of encouragement into your life. And we do it together. We move forward. You don't have to get stuck where you're at. And it's true that there's life, even great successes, mountaintops, we can find ourselves in a valley before we know it. Or we have great service and we serve our heart out and then somebody forgets it. Or we forget how God served us. Right? But even in places of shortage, God promises fullness to come. And so we lean in towards that. We work towards that. You know, the greatest fullness we'll ever have is the piece of wood that God sent and put his son on. On Calvary, Jesus Christ, he comes to bring freedom. He bring, comes to bring us out of discouragement. He br brings fullness, brings promise, bring healing. Like he said to the Israelites, I am the God who heals you. That is a word for you. God says, I am a God who heals, who redeems, and who restores. Let's bow our heads and we'll close in prayer. Well, Lord, I pray for um, those who are in a place of, of uh, discouragement, disappointment. Maybe you've been going it over and over in your mind, throwing a pity party. You're, you've told everybody else, but it's your turn now to tell God. Maybe you've been acting like that practical atheist. Sure, you believe in God, but the honest truth is you haven't really gone to God with this. You go and you throw the wood, the cross, into, your, into that place of bitterness, into that place of hardship, into that disappointment. 
How do you do that, Andy? Well, let me just tell you. You go to God in prayer. Now, I think thinking prayer is fine. Thinking prayer works. But Jesus actually, when the disciples said, how do we pray? Jesus said, I want you to say. There's something powerful when we actually declare it with our lips. When we pray and we say, God, help me. Save me. Heal me. And so today I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And if you have the courage to pray it out loud. If not, just pray it in your mind, in your heart. Certainly God can hear that. And so you say, God, I'm disappointed. The pain I've gone through has led me into places of, that are very dark. So I need your healing. You say, God, I need your deliverance. I need your, your touch. Would you say, God, help me to realize that a disappointment in your hands becomes an appointment. An opportunity to advance your purpose in my life. Would you say, God, just take a moment for confession. Say, God, forgive me for times in my lives when I've, when I've not pursued your, your perfect purpose for my life. It's not about other people. Nobody can keep me from living the life you have for me except for me. And so that's why it's confession. It's just, it's just you. You, you, maybe you've been in the habit of pointing fingers and blaming other people why you can't live the life God has for you, but it's not true. You say, God, today, I ask for your forgiveness. When I have resisted your, 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 your touch, your draw, as you've wanted to steer even when people have tried to harm me, you'll steer that to advance your purpose in my life. I'm not going to, would you say, God, I'm not going to blame other people anymore with your help. I don't want to fall into negativity. Today, God wants to move you out of Mara, move you to Elam. You just take another, take a step. Today, take that step. If you've never put your faith in Christ or maybe it's been a long time, you do that right now. Whether you're online or you're here, you just say, God, today I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. That you can change my circumstances. That you can lift me out of disappointment. So today I put my faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.